Geekies and Germs. Welcome to the April Money Matters Mastermind or the April Wealth Mastermind. You call it whatever you want. We're talking about money on the third Thursday of every month. And today we are joined by our partner, uh, Bobby Bodner, who is a tax professional, tax accounting, bookkeeping uh, guru. Uh, he's done sessions for us on uh, building your net worth, on crypto, on um, structuring an LLC, what's an S-Corp, a lot of stuff to help our agents keep more of the money they make. The easiest way to keep more of the money you make is what, Bobby? Don't give it to the government. Do not give it to the government. Don't give anything to the government uh, if you can help it. So um, while that is a huge cornerstone of, uh, of a lot of the strategy, and by the way, uh, a couple of days ago, taxes were due. Uh, if you didn't enjoy doing your taxes, if you felt like you paid too much in taxes, Bobby has uh, helped a lot of our agents save a lot of money. Uh, I won't call anyone out, but we have, have agents who have been in the business for 30 years and for the first time got money back from the government. Uh, and so Bobby is an expert in what he does. So if you don't like doing it or you feel like you're giving up too much, don't do it next year. Start having a conversation with Bobby about how to put yourself in a position to keep more of what you earn. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Today, we're going to talk about something that Bobby helps his clients with called the wealth hierarchy. And so he is going to be walking our group through the 12 steps on a journey to financial independence. Now, I know for a lot of folks, the idea of financial independence might seem like it is actually financially impossible, right? We are in a day-to-day -day and deal-to-deal -deal world. The market's given us a lot of challenging things. The key to success is one, taking a step back, taking a deep breath and understanding what are all the pieces in this puzzle and then having a methodical approach to putting it together. Uh, Bobby has uh, counseled me on a lot of the stuff that he's gonna talk to you about today uh, and believe it or not, has slowed me down uh, because I was trying to do everything all at once. And if we get our ducks in the row, one, we can eat this elephant one bite at a time. And two, you can do it in a way where you can see progress, right? You don't just see the finish line. You go from step one about eliminating personal debt to step two, which is about getting your structures in order. And now I'm stealing his mojo. But uh, Bobby, so excited for you to be with us fresh off of uh, you know one of your 12 busy seasons here. Uh, tax time. So appreciate you being a part of the party. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. I'm going to give you share screen ability if you don't already have it. Um, and you are going to, um, whoops. How do I, how do I let you share the screen? He already does, Mike. Okay, cool. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, all right, Bobby. So without any further ado, my friend, the floor is yours. Um, tell us what we need to know. All right. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, I think you nailed a lot of that. And what we're going to hit today is what Mike called the wealth building hierarchy. So this is something that we put together at, at Bredify, uh, which we're going to hit on in a second. But it is essentially a step-by-step -step guide on where to put your money first to start building wealth over time, right? Because saving money on taxes, which is what, you know, that's like the sexy thing that everyone wants to do is stop giving all their money to the government. That's really just the beginning. Because you want to save the money on taxes, stop giving it to the government, but then buy income producing assets with it to then build wealth for you and your family. So saving money on taxes is really just the beginning of the story. Um, as uh, Mike said, my name's uh, Bobby Bodner. I'm the managing partner at Bredify. Uh, I am an IRS enrolled agent. I got my master's in tax from Purdue. Uh, and my specialty is helping business owners such as yourselves and investors and real estate professionals save money on taxes so that they can build wealth for themselves and their family. Uh, Bredify, this is just a quick overview. We basically take all of the boring stuff that you guys are forced to deal with as business owners, which each one of you are. If you're receiving a 1099, you are a business owner. So that's the way you want to see yourself. Anytime you're getting a 1099 and you're not receiving a W-2, 
you are a business owner, which means you're entitled, you're, you're basically playing a different game of taxes than pure W-2 uh, income earners. And that's great for you because W-2 income earners pay the most tax. If you look at their, mar like their, how much they're effectively paying in tax, they pay the most because they have no deductions. You as a 1099, a business owner, if you're receiving 1099 K-1 uh, income, earned income, you are able to offset that income with ordinary and necessary business expenses. So we specialize in doing all of the things that you don't want to do, like bookkeeping, accounting, payroll, tax, to make sure you can focus on making the money and then we help you keep it. Uh, we do offer a special deal for KW agents, specific, specifically your group. And um, it, it, it's a two-part deal. We One, you get a free 30-minute consult with me specifically about your situation. And also we waive our startup fee that we typically had for new members. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to use this link. I'll share this with Mike and he can share with you guys as well. Uh, but this is, you're able to schedule time directly onto my calendar. We can sit down. Uh, we could review a previous year tax return. We could do whatever you want for 30 minutes. Uh, and we can see where you're at and see if Redify makes sense for you. Okay, so now we're getting into the good stuff. So what is wealth? Uh, essentially, there's a big difference between being rich and being wealthy. If you you could ask this question, do it, you know, go talk to a professional, uh, an NFL player making millions of dollars a year just to be poor five years after retire after they get out of the NFL, right? It, it, you can make a lot of money. You can be a massive uh, W-2 wage earner but you can ultimately not be wealthy. So the whole point is make money doing whatever it is that you do, buy assets with it, income producing assets to help you build wealth so that you can stop working. The other benefit of that is that the income you earn, like 1099 income, W-2 income, it's taxed at a higher tax rate than passive income, such as rental real estate, or if I passively invest into a business. These are all things we're going to discuss, but you are taxed at a lower tax rate because you're not subject to self-employment tax uh, or payroll taxes, which is a 15.3% tax that you get hit with on every dollar that you make. There's ways to avoid that, such as the S-Corp, which we've hit on in previous sessions. But the point is you want to make money, not blow it on dumb things, and then move that money and buy assets with it will then produce that will then produce it passive income and wealth so you can stop working. So this this whole point here is like what is wealth? If you ask Google, an abundance of valuable possessions or money. To me, wealth is being able to do what you want every day without having to worry about can I afford it or you know affordability concerns or do I have the money for this? Just being able to live your life. Uh, and like an analogy, I like to, you know if you if you go to a restaurant, being able to order anything you want on the restaurant menu. And not looking at the price. It just doesn't matter to you, right? Because like, if you want the steak, you order the steak. Like, it doesn't matter that it's a little bit more expensive. You'd be like, oh, can I afford that? Right? That's what wealth is to me. So it's different to everyone. But to me, it's just being able to make decisions on a daily basis, doing what you want to do and not have to worry about, can I afford these things? Um, and lastly, like this is what I was saying. You want to be able to buy assets with your earned income, generate passive cash flow, uh, which is then taxed at a lower tax rate. Uh, what is... The wealth building hierarchy. So this is what Mike was alluding to. This was a step-by-step -step guide that we put together. And what we're going to do is we're going to hit the high level. We're going to talk about the trifecta, which is something that we build out for our members. We built it out for Mike recently. Uh, and we're going to hit on that in a second, but then we're going to hit each one of these steps in a little bit more detail. So the wealth building hierarchy, it's a step-by-step -step guide to building tax, tax-free wealth as a business owner for you and your family. So it's, in, it's important that we recognize that this is for business owners, and specifically, it works the best for business owners without W-2 employees. So a real estate agent is a great example of that. Many real estate agents make 1099 business income, and they do not have W-2 employees that they are also paying. That opens the door to up here at the top of this pyramid, steps 9 and 10, which we're going to hit on, is funding your solo 401k, which is by far the best retirement vehicle for business owners without W-2 employees. But because this is a hierarchy, right? You start at the bottom. Some of these things you might be like, oh, you know, like the, uh, the whole, I've heard about whole life insurance and I heard it's a great way, you know, infinite banking and all this crazy stuff on YouTube that you can do. Yeah, it's great. It can play a piece of the puzzle, but it's not step one. So you always, we, we built this out because once people start making money on, or saving money on taxes, they're like, where do I put my money first? So this isn't about what do I invest in? This is about where do I put the money and how do I get it into tax-free accounts to then go invest in whatever you know best, all right? The trifecta. 
the trifecta is a visual diagram of your entire financial life. So what it is, is it's a visual representation of all the business entities, your revenue streams, retirement accounts, investments, rental properties that you currently own, and how are they and how they are taxed differently. So I'm going to show you here a, dem a demo template version of a trifecta that we build out for our members. And this might just look like a lot of shapes and lines here, but ultimately this is the story of someone's financial life. And if, if I have this information on someone, I can learn a lot about not only what, they, what they're doing, but are they good savers? Are they in debt? Do they have any investments? Do they have rental property? Have they, have they been good at saving for retirement? Are, how are they making their money? Are they W-2 or 1099? This is a comprehensive overview of all of the different things that are going on in your life. So building one of these out, uh, we found it makes a huge difference because it al allows us to talk in a way that clients understand. So we'd be like, okay, here is your LLC and here's your S corp or here's your rental property. And here's how it is taxed differently from uh, your, your LLC over here on the left side. And, and one point, to, and the reason it's called the trifecta uh, is because it's broken into three parts here. Okay. So we have the left side, we have the right side, and then we have this bottom third. The left side is the operations. It's your ordinary income. So this is you going out, uh, selling homes, making commissions. You've got your uh, 1099 income coming in over here. And hopefully that 1099 income is getting funneled into your escort. If you have a spouse who's a W-2 wage earner, that's over here. So this is a very common setup where you'd have a business owner, uh, they have an S corporation, they are receiving 1099 income, they own 100% of this S corporation, and then up here, they might have a partnership. So for example, if uh, Mike has his S corp, I have my S corp, and then Mike was like, hey, I'm starting this new business, do you want to partner together? I'd be like, great. Instead of starting up another entity and taxing that as an S corporation, what we can do is have my S corporation and his S corporation partner together in this 1065 partnership return. So we all get the same tax benefits. We're still funneling this money through an S corp, but we don't have to have extra payroll, extra tax returns. Uh, and and it, it's just the most efficient way of partnering with someone uh, through an S corporation. All right. And also, I just wanted to say this, like, I, I when I do these, I feel like it's just kind of like me talking a lot. And if anyone has any questions as I'm going through any of this, please let me know. And I'm happy to go back like, hey, I didn't get that. Or, hey, can you please rephrase that? I, you know, can you explain that in a different way? I'm happy to do it. And I, I want this time to be beneficial to, to you guys. So if there's anything you want me to hit harder on or say re-explain in another way, please, please uh, let me know. Okay. The left side, so that's operations. And the reason why we separate out operations from the right side is because operations are subject to what's called self-employment tax. That's FICA, Social Security, Medicare. Those are your payroll taxes. So for example, when you're a W-2 employee, right, you pay 7.65%. Your employer pays the other 7.65%, which adds up to 15.3%. When you are self-employed, you pay both halves because the IRS says, well, you're self-employed. We see you as both the employee and the employer. So that's why when you're self-employed and you take zero precaution and you're just making 1099 income and you're just putting it on the Schedule C of your tax return, you are getting absolutely hammered. Uh, you know, Between Fed, state, local, and self-employment tax, you could easily be at 50% tax bracket, right? So the, the way to minimize that is by funneling this money through an S corporation and taking both a W-2 as well as a K-1. So what happens is all of the money that you take on a K-1 completely avoids the 15.3% self-employment tax. What you take on the W-2 is still subject to the payroll taxes, but you're only taking a reasonable amount. So what you're, you know, maybe you made hundred grand instead of having the whole hundred grand subject to 15.3%, maybe you're gonna take 50,000 of it as a K-1 and 50,000 is W-2, and then 50,000 just completely avoided that. So it's saving you thousands of dollars every single year just by structuring it differently. And like, we're not going to go too deep into the S-Corp. I just wanted to mention that because it's on here. Um, but that's left side income. So we separate that out because it's at a higher tax rate. If we move over to the right side, we have your assets. We further break down the right side into three things. Tax preferred accounts, individual accounts, and rental real estate. So that first column, tax preferred accounts. What we have here are things like 401ks, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, solo 401ks, SEP IRAs, all of these tax preferred vehicles. And what tax preferred means, it means it's either pre-tax or post-tax dollars. So it's either traditional or Roth dollars. So traditional dollars, if, if, or if, you, if you didn't know that when you put money in to a traditional IRA, right, you get a tax deduction for what you're putting in. So you get an immediate tax deduction for when you put the money in. 
the money then grows tax-free in the account, and then you can pull it out at retirement where you're going to pay ordinary income tax. So it's not the best, but it is a way to at least not have to pay tax while you are investing, right? You get a little tax deduction now, you invest, it grows tax-free, but then you pay tax when you pull it out. The alternative is what's after-tax dollars or Roth accounts. So if I put $6,000 into a Roth IRA, I don't get the tax deduction now, but then I put the 6000 in, I invest in whatever I want, I'm um, buying, I'm selling, I'm paying zero tax. It's growing completely tax-free. And then I pull it out tax-free at retirement. We love Roth accounts. If, if it's ever a debate on, should I put this money in traditional or Roth? We typically 95% of the time go Roth. There are a uh, few exceptions where traditional might make more sense if you really need a tax deduction now in this year. But in the long term for building wealth, Roth accounts are better than traditional accounts, in our opinion. Um, all right, moving on, individual so this middle column is essentially if I just opened up a uh, TD Ameritrade or a Fidelity account and I was just buying and selling stocks, it's not in a tax preferred vehicle. It's just me buying and selling assets or, or capital assets. Same thing with crypto. If I, if I went and opened up a Coinbase account and I bought some Bitcoin and then I sold some Bitcoin, these are all taxable events in the year that you uh, a taxable event occurs. So if I sell it in that tax year, I'm going to pay tax on it. This would also include things like maybe a uh, private investments. For example, if I was starting a new restaurant and I went to Mike and I said, Hey, Mike, I'm starting a new restaurant. Um, I know you don't know anything about the restaurant industry, but I, you got a lot of money, right? So how about you give me 50 grand? I'm going to take your 50 grand. I'll give you a little bit of equity in my business and I'm going to go off. This is like Shark Tank, right? Like the Shark Tank, the those investors are not materially participating and actively working in the businesses. What they're doing is they're providing capital and guidance, and then they're out there doing operations. The reason why that's over here on the right side is because it is not subject to self-employment tax as long as you're not materially participating in the business. So as just the pure capital partner, you gave me 50 grand, I'm the one operating the business. To me, that's left side income. To Mike, that's right side income because he's not doing anything. He just gave me capital and I'm going to give him a K-1 at the end of the year. So the uh, you're going to hear me referring to left side, right side income. And that's I'm referring to this diagram. Left side income is operations. Right side income is assets and passive cash flow and things like that. All right. The third final column over here, we have rental real estate. So this would be if you bought a long term rental or an Airbnb, a short term rental, and you had a rental property producing cash flow that you put into an LLC. So that's what this uh, circle over here is. You have the LLC. And then you deed the property into the LLC and this cash flow funnels down onto your 1040. So left side, right side. The bottom third is a combination of your revocable living trust, your will, and your 1040. So you want all of these different revenue streams, assets, everything's going to funnel down onto your revocable living trust and your 1040. So ultimately, you want to have these assets owned by your revocable living trust. Uh, the primary reason for that is to avoid probate in the event that you pass away. Uh, but it also provides privacy. So, you know, if someone looked up who owns this rental, it's not going to say your name. It's going to say, you know, XYZ Revocable Living Trust. You can call it the Purple Rain Revo Revocable Living Trust, right? So uh, everyone should ultimately have a revocable living trust in a will. It's a lot of people just don't do it because they don't want to think about dying. And a lot of people don't do it because uh, they don't think they're going to die now. Uh, it it's, doesn't matter how old you are. We always recommend a revocable living trust in a will, which ultimately it has no tax consequence. It just, it, uh, irregard, it's disregarded for tax purposes and all funnels still down on your 1040. Uh, lastly, we have these little other assets, things like your personal res residence or maybe a term life insurance policy, things that are valuable and they may funnel onto your 1040, but they are not income producing assets. So does anyone have any questions so far on high level wealth building hierarchy, as well as uh, this trifecta. Okay. I'm going to assume the silence is good and no one has fallen asleep yet, but we're going to keep moving. The step one. So we're going to start right at the bottom of this pyramid. So the bottom of this pyramid, before you even get into investing, we're talking about eliminating personal consumer debt. So the last thing that you want to do is start putting money into a Roth IRA or traditional IRA or a 401k just to realize that, oh my God, I'm in you know, I'm paying 22% per month in interest to my credit card company because I am not paying off my balance in full. And then you have to pull money out of there to pay this off because then you're hitting penalties and tax. So the bottom line is you want to get out of personal consumer debt. And these are, it's important to understand the difference between good debt and bad debt because there's some people who just think debt is debt and debt is bad, right? So the way I see debt is it's a tool. The same way a hammer is a tool, right? If, if someone hands you a hammer, you could take it and you can go build a house with it. Or, you know, you could go do productive activity with a hammer. 
Or you could take this hammer and you could hit someone over the head with it and you can go to jail, right? This hammer is a tool. The hammer in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It is just a hammer. Debt is neither good nor bad. It is simply a tool. And the whole point is how do we use debt to our advantage? And good debt is low interest debt that you use to build wealth. And the whole point is using debt at a lower interest rate to then buy assets that are earning you a higher rate of return. Bad debt, on the other hand, is high interest rate debt. So you're paying whoever lent you the money, a lot of money every month um, in interest. Uh, and you're using that money to not buy productive assets. You're buying personal consumption items. You're just going out and you're blowing it at Vegas. You're going out on nice vacations and you're not paying off your credit card in full every month. So the first step is get out of bad, high interest consumer debt. Next, once you're out of the bad consumer debt, we're going to move on to setting aside money in what we like to call an emergency saving reserve. So this is a highly liquid savings account that is earning some sort of interest and interest rates have been going up recently, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Uh, for example, Ally Bank is one that I use personally. Um, and they, I believe, are now at 3.75% APY. So, I mean, it's pretty good for a pretty low, I mean, you, we, you can make the argument that it's low interest or that it's, or it's, it's low uh, uh, risk or it's high risk, depending on the banking system and whether your bank deposits are secure, but we're not going to go down that path right now. The bottom line is you definitely want to make sure it is FDIC insured. So you want a highly, li highly liquid interest bearing savings account that is FDIC insured. And what you're going to do is you're going to take three to five months of fixed living costs. So these are things, you know, like your mortgage payment or your rent payment, food, car payments, insurance uh, premiums, real estate, like things that are fixed, where if you did not pay them, you're going to be in some serious trouble, right? You're going to get kicked out on the street. Uh, you're going to lose your assets. You're going it, to, it's, it's not going to look good for you, right? So you're going to figure out what that amount is per month, set aside three to five months of it into a highly liquid, fairly high interest uh, account where you can pull of it, pull on it in, in the event of emergency. So if no more income came in for three months, you're going to be fine. You're, you're still able to cover your, uh, your, your liabilities. So that right here is step two. You're setting aside the money and, be, and you're getting out of bad debt. Now we're going to get into the fun part, which is actually putting the money to work, right? You're out of the bad debt. You've got some money set aside in worst case scenario. Now let's start building wealth. We like to call step three, the matching out. So the matching out is specifically geared towards those who have either a day job and a side hustle, or they have a day or they have a, uh, full-time business and the spouse has a day job, which is very common. Like that's the same in my, in, for my situation where I have a business, my wife has a day job. So for example, what we do is in her 401k, there's typically what's called an elective safe harbor, which is a matching plan. Uh, the way it works is the plan will match 100% of contributions up to 3% wages and 50% of contributions up to five. So if you, it, what, what this works, the way this works is if you made hundred thousand dollars on your W-2, if that's what your wages said, you can put in $3,000 and your employer will immediately put in another three to match, right? Cause it's going to match hundred percent of the first 3% of my wages. So if I put 3000 in, they put 3000 in, I just doubled my money. That's the easiest, uh, you know, free money rate of return that you're going to get. You put money in, they put money in, you just doubled your money. Next, they will match 50% of the next 2% of my contribution. So I can put in another thousand, another 2,000, and then they will put in 1,000. So if I put in five, they will put in four. It's a fantastic rate of return on your money, and it's essentially free money. The downside of this is you have very little control of what these things are invested in, as long as you are still with that employee, right? You're going to put money into the 401k. They are going to give you probably three options of what you can put it in, high risk, medium risk, low risk, whatever you want to do, and then buy. You don't really know what they're doing with it. You just look at your statement and hope it went up. Uh, the other downside is there's typically high fees. They don't tell you this, and it's hard to find exactly what the fee amount is in these 401k plans. But when they are investing your money, they are paying someone and they are taking fees out of your gains. So you're actually getting less of a rate of return. So you do this because it's free money. You're not doing this because it's an amazing investment. You hope it goes up. You hope you invest it well and, and the stock market goes up, but it is essentially free money. But the reason we call it the matching out is because we're not saying put in the full amount. Some people uh, go way too far on this step where they will, you can put up to $22,000 for 2023. They're just like, put the whole thing in. You know, just like take enough out of my paycheck every pay period where we're just going to max this thing out. You can do that, but you're missing the rest of the pyramid. So a lot of what a lot of people, what people will do is just stop right here. They got out of debt. They have a little bit of money set aside and then they max out a 401k and then they're done. Well, you just missed the majority of this pyramid and the majority of this pyramid is where, where 
real wealth is built for business owners. So to recap, what we're doing here is putting enough money into the 401k J job just so that you get 100% of the match, which is typically uh, this safe harbor election. But you would want to confirm that with the HR department and, and you know what it, what it is for where you are. But this right here is a great way of essentially doubling your money. Any questions so far before we hit the next step? Okay. Uh, next is Roth IRA. The Roth IRA is by far, I'll say the Roth IRA and the HSA, but this is one of the best retirement accounts in, in the US. So the Roth IRA, like I said, it allows you to contribute after tax dollars, which means you're not getting a tax deduction when you put the money in, but then you put the contributions in, it all grows completely tax-free and you can pull it out tax-free at retirement. Um, you can't pull out the earnings until 59 and a half, which is retirement, and the account must be open for at least five years. So if you're getting near the 59 and a half age range, you definitely want to make sure that not only have uh, you're, you're, you, you understand that you can't pull it out till 59 and a half, but also the account needs to be open for five years. So that's only for people who are, are around that age range. But uh, the other thing to consider here is there's a difference between contributions and earnings. For example, if I put $6,000 into my Roth IRA, okay, that, those are my contributions. I just contributed $6,000. If I, the $6,000 then grows to $7,000 because of my investment, I now have $1,000 of earnings. $6,000 contribution, my investment went up. I now have $1,000 of earnings for a total of $7,000 in this account. You cannot pull out the earnings until the 59 and a half retirement. But I can pull out my contributions, my direct contributions at any age, no penalty, no tax. And we're going to hit on one of the later steps. I believe it is uh, step eight, which is getting your kids Roth IRAs going, which is an amazing strategy. It's a way for you to be able to put money in and then pull money out to maybe pay for, they can pay for their own education. But the, it, it's what's a common misconception is they think that all the money in the Roth IRA can't be pulled out till retirement. It's not true. Only the earnings cannot be pulled out till retirement. Your direct contributions into a Roth IRA can be pulled out at any age, no penalty, no tax. Because remember, they're after tax dollars that you put in. You didn't get a tax deduction to put the money in. The reason why you wouldn't want to do that is because then you're cutting off the compounding growth that you're getting tax free. Right? So you want to leave the money in as long as possible because you're getting compound tax-free growth. But if you need to take the money out, you can take out direct contributions at any age, no penalty, no tax. Another thing to be very aware of with Roth IRAs, which I see messed up constantly, is that if you are considered a high income earner, which really is not that high if you look at these limits. So for 2023, Maggie, which is your modified adjusted gross income, it, your, the limit is 138 k if you're single or 218 k if you're married filing jointly. So it's not that high. A lot of people hit these limits. So a lot of people think that you cannot contribute to a Roth IRA because I make too much money. I've heard that argument or I've heard that statement countless times where like, uh, I was told I can't contribute to a Roth IRA because I make too much money. Wrong. You can contribute uh, to a Roth IRA at any income level. I don't care if you're Warren Buffett. I don't care if you're making a million dollars a year as a professional athlete. You can still do it, but you just can't go through the front door. Notice how this says front or back door. The front door is you're under those limits. You just put the money directly into a Roth IRA. If you are above those limits, you have to do what's known as a backdoor Roth IRA. So the backdoor Roth IRA is essentially just an extra step where you're going to take your $6,000 you want to put in. You're going to open up a traditional IRA first. You're going to put the money directly into that traditional IRA. And then you're going to convert that money from the traditional to the Roth. So that extra step by putting it into their traditional first, waiting a day for it to clear, and then converting those funds to Roth, that is the backdoor Roth IRA. You can do that at any income limit, doesn't matter. So the important thing to note is if you're even near these limits, do the backdoor Roth IRA. If you're like, I don't know, I'm getting close, I'm around 138, or I'm around 130, I'm single, I don't think I'm gonna hit it, do the backdoor. Because if you're gonna, if what the word what you don't want to do is put it in the front door and then realize at the end of the year when you're doing your taxes your Maggie's too high. If that happens, you have what's called an excess Roth contribution and you have to pull that money out. You have to pay penalties and tax. You got it. It's, it's a disaster. So you want to avoid that at all costs. If you're near those income limits, do the backdoor Roth, but that should not deter you from doing a Roth IRA at all. You should still do it. The other thing to point out is that if you are uh, under 50 for 2023, it's 6,500. If you're 50 or older, you get an extra thousand catch up. So it's 7,500 if you're 50 or older for 2023. 
Step five, it's essentially a continuation of step four where it's doing exactly what you just did, but do it for your spouse. You're gonna be doubling what you're able to put into these Roth accounts by doing it for both you and your spouse. The IRA stands for individual retirement account or individual retirement arrangement, all right? So it's an individual account. It has nothing to do with your business. It has nothing to do with your employer. This has all to do with you as an individual. Anyone can have an IRA. Um, what you wanna be able to do is double up what you can contribute to your Roth uh, so by doing what you just did for your spouse is the best way to do that. If your spouse is a stay-at-home spouse or a non-working spouse, maybe they're taking care of the kids and you work full-time, so they don't have earned income. Uh, the only requirement to have a, or to contribute to an IRA is you need to have earned income. So what that means is you're out there, you're producing some sort of income, right? It's not passive income, like it's actually earned income from you selling goods or services, that left side income. Uh, when you have that earned income, you can contribute. Some spouses may not be working and then you think that they can't contribute because they don't have the earned income. The IRS thought of that and they didn't want to penalize non-working spouses. So they have what's called a spousal IRA, which is essentially the same thing. As long as the primary spouse has enough earned income where, you know, so as long as they made over $12,000, $13,000, they can also, the spouse can contribute as well. You're basically using the, uh, the working spouse's income to put it into your IRA. So that's just something else to consider. Step five is making sure that both you and your spouse are maxing out the Roth IRA. Um, any questions before we hit HSA? Okay. Uh, the, yes, I have a, a question. Sure. So I thought that if a person was coming from another retirement system, let's say that I'm currently a member of PERS right now, right? And let's say that I decided I wanted to leave my current employment and I wanted to roll, I don't mm -hmm. know, 50 grand over into an IRA. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be able to do that with those limits though, right? No, if they uh, have so, like a 60. No, uh, no, no. So yeah, so those are different. So those are new contribution limits. So that's a good question. And the way this works is if you say you have a day job 401k um, and you leave that employer. So basically what happens, you have two choices or sometimes the, the employer makes the choice for you, but two things will happen. One, the money that you had contributed into the employer 401k, it's just going to sit there and it's just going to keep growing. And it's, it's still your money, even though you left the employment, but it's just going to sit at that old 401k. The other option is the employer is going to say, hey, you left employment, you need to roll this money out. And then what they do is they roll it out into an IRA. So that's fine. And you, so if you left your employer and they roll out those funds into a traditional IRA is typically what that'll be in, then you can then convert that money to Roth, but that has nothing to do with those limits. The, those limits are the new contributions. So those are the 401k money that's getting rolled over. Those are old contributions from previous years. This is if you want to put more money into an IRA. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Yes. Yes. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Great question. So um, next, we're going to move on to step six, which is the HSA. And this is probably the most underutilized of all of them, maybe step seven for people with kids. But step six is the HSA. I love it. It's arguably the best tax vehicle in the United States because it is the only one that is triple tax benefited. So what that means is you put money in, right? So you put money in the HSA, you get a tax deduction when you do that. That's great. That's tax benefit one. It then grows in that account, completely tax-free. You can invest in whatever you want and it's going to grow completely tax-free. That's tax benefit number two. You can also pull out the funds completely tax-free at any age, as long as you use it for qualified medical. So that's tax benefit number three. So basically it is a, it's even better arguably than the Roth IRA because remember the Roth IRA, when you put the money in, you don't get a tax deduction. You're putting in after-tax dollars. With this, you're putting in pre-tax dollars. It's still growing tax-free and you pull it out tax-free at any age, as long as you use it for qualified medical. The one uh, counterpart of this is you need to make sure you qualify for an HSA. And the way to qualify for an HSA is you have to have what's known as a high deductible health plan, also called an HDHP. Uh, and there are IRS guidelines for what types of medical plans qualify as an HDHP. But the easiest way is to actually just look at whatever health insurance you have and just check with them directly and say, hey, I want to open up an HSA. Is this HSA eligible? And if they say yes, fantastic. If not, you can wait until next open enrollment or a qualifying event throughout the year, and you can uh, change your health insurance plan. Typically, if you're getting your health insurance through a W-2 employer, either through for your employer or your spouse's, um, they'll have probably two plans. So they're going to have a non-HSA plan or a non-HDHP plan and an HDHP eligible plan. And you can just switch it. You can be like, And you can switch it from year to year. 
For example, uh, I had a kid last year and there's a lot of expenses. And I'm sure many of you know, when you're having a kid that I didn't want to have a high deductible health plan during that year that I knew we were going to have a lot of medical expenses. So we had the better health insurance uh, with the lower premium or a uh, lower deductible for last year. This year, we changed that. We changed that because I love the HSA, knowing how powerful it is. So we changed it to an HSA eligible plan this year. So you can switch it from year to year as long as you have that uh, qualifying plan. Um, you can put, let's see, I have my handy dandy sheet here for HSA. So for 2020, so it's different for single and family. So single for 2023 is 3850 and married or family plan for 2023 is 7750 So you can put up to that amount into uh, your HSA every year, depending on whether the health insurance plan covers just you or if it co covers you and your dependents. If it's you and your dependents, you're in the family plan range and you can put more money in. Oh, before I forget, this is awesome. And I, I, I hope that this makes sense. And if this doesn't make sense, this is a super powerful way to use an HSA. And I really want this to sink in for you guys. Okay. So the way I, the way you can use, there's two ways to use an HSA. The first way is by basically just getting a medical deduction. So a lot of people think that you can write off your medical expenses when you really cannot. And the only way you can do that is uh, if you itemize your tax return, which many people don't. And even if you do, you only get above the seven and a half floor limit. So for example, if I have a hundred thousand dollar AGI, and I spent 10 grand on out-of-pocket medical, I can't write off the first $7,500 of medical. It's just gone. It doesn't do anything for me. I can only write off that remaining 2,500 on top of the 75, and I can only take a small percentage of that, and I can only do it if it's itemized. So but the bottom line is, medical is a terrible tax deduction unless you're going to be using a something like an HSA. So if you're like, well, I just want a tax deduction for my medical, then you can do an HSA. You can essentially just put money into the HSA, immediately take it right back out, go spend it on qualified medical, Boom, you're done. You just got a medical expense. So if you are one spending out-of-pocket medical, an HSA can be a great option for you. But the way to build wealth with an HSA is the alternative version. That's what, is what I'm about to get to right now, all right? So this is high-level stuff. What you're going to do is you're going to put the money in the HSA every year. Put the money in. And when you have qualified medical, you're not going to take the money out, all right? So you're going to put the money in. You're going to invest in whatever you want. I have a client who literally bought a rental property in his HSA. And it produces cash flow in the HSA, completely tax free. He used that cash flow to go pay for his kids' braces. Like it, 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 you can buy almost any investment in an HSA. So I just want to point that out that it's not like I just have to go buy stocks and bonds. You can buy whatever you know best. All right. So you put the money in, you invest it, and you, it's growing tax free. But instead of pulling the money out as you're incurring these out of pocket medical, what you do, you leave it in there. All right. So you leave the money in the HSA com compounding and growing tax-free. But what you do is you keep the receipt. So when you went and paid for your kids' braces, instead of actually pulling the money out of the HSA, you're going to keep the receipt, keep the receipt, keep the receipt. Just, you know, date, what'd you buy, the amount, all of that, right? Have your backup. And then maybe five, 10 years from now, you're like, you know what? This HSA, it's got a lot of money in here, but I don't have any out-of-pocket medical this year. Well, what you can do is reimburse yourself for expenses, qualified medical expenses that you spent years ago. So now you're using it as a tax-free ATM because you're reimbursing yourself for expenses that you incurred years ago because there's no time limit on when you have to do this reimbursement. So the way to build wealth with this account is put the money in, let it grow tax-free, investing in what you know best. And then when you incur out-of-pocket medical, pay for it personally, keep the receipt, and then reimburse yourself years from now when you want to start pulling money out as a tax-free ATM. Hopefully that made sense because this is Pro it's probably my favorite. It's been definitely the most underutilized because no one really understands the HSA or no one utilizes it the right way. But the HSA can be an amazing wealth building tax free vehicle. Any questions on that? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, how did he buy a house? You you don't he didn't take the money out of the HSA. So uh, he so that was a different example. So what he did was he he was building up his HSA for a while, hence his ability to actually uh, you know put a down payment down for a home, right? So. Um, or I, he might've bought it cash. I'm not exactly sure. It was years ago, but the bottom line is he had an HSA or a, a rental property in his HSA and he was using the cash flow. So he was doing the first version, which is as the HSA is producing income, he's pulling it out and he's spending it. So he's not letting it grow. But what he could have done is left that in the account, the cash flow as it's producing. And then maybe he could have had enough money and bought another house in his HSA or a different type or crypto or whatever, you know, whatever he wants to do. But, but what my, what I was getting at with the second version is 
don't actually take the money out, let it keep growing and then reimburse yourself down the road. Once you have enough qualified medical and you're just using it as an ATM. Does that make sense? Sort of. I'm still confused, but I, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk through with you I mean, because do you have, what are you confused on? Uh, well, you mentioned like bought it in an HSA. Like what does that, right. what does that mean? So an HSA is just an account, just like a 401k. I could go buy a rental property in my 401k. I can go buy a rental property in my IRA. I can go buy a rental property in my own name. Um, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's just a way of who is the owner of this rental property. So your health savings account can go buy any other type of asset, just like you personally could or any other retirement uh, okay. Account so, so it's not you buy it in the name of that HSA. Yeah. So the, the, and you can do that because basically what you're doing is you're self-directing any of these retirement accounts. A lot of people don't understand that, uh, when you go into TD Ameritrade and you open up a, say a Roth IRA or an, or an HSA or any account with them, they're going to say, you can't buy a rental property in uh, IRA, right? They're that because they don't let you do that. It's not that you're not allowed to do it. It's that TD Ameritrade does not let you do that. So if you want to do it, you have to go to a, a custodian or a trust company that allows you to do it. So the one we recommend uh, is, it's called Directed IRA. Um, they allow you to self-direct any of your retirement accounts and they are doing an amazing job. I've got multi, I, you know, I've got step seven, which we're going to hit on Coverdell accounts. I've got one of those self-directed and HSA self-directed. I've got Roth IRA for me and my spouse, like all of these steps. I personally am doing the exact same thing, right? So you can self-direct any of these accounts if you want to. And if you're like, I don't want to self-direct it. I just want to buy, you know, Tesla stock. That's fine. You don't need to self-direct and you go buy that. But the bottom line is you can self-direct any of these retirement accounts. So um, that's that's what I mean by buying something in the HSA. It's like that is the purchaser of that asset. But I guess I'm just confused because that, that money, you need to pay the seller when you're buying a property. So it has to come out of the HSA. So you're saying, but right. it has to stay in the HSA. So I guess I'm just confused. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I think we're getting hyper-focused on how to buy a rental property in the HSA, which we definitely don't have time to hit on right now. But the bottom line is the point I'm trying to make is you can buy assets, alternative assets in these retirement vehicles, all right? If you want to right. discuss how to specifically buy a rental property in a retirement account, that, that's that's another story that we can go down that path. Like if you want to schedule a consult, happy to talk yeah. about it there. But the bottom, like, like the point to take away from this is you can buy these assets in the self-directed retirement accounts. Okay. All right. I don't want to run out of time here. Is is my is is, your, is the screen glitching for you guys or is it only glitching for me? I'm not sure. It's glitching. Okay. All right. So, uh I don't know. Let me see if I can just stop share real quick and then go back. Okay. All right. Can, Oh, it's doing it again. All right, we're just going to keep moving. We're going to keep moving. The Coverdell here. So the Coverdell is essentially a Roth IRA account, or it's a similar to a Roth account, but it's for kids' education. So what you can do is you can put up to $2,000 per year per child into this account, and, and you can invest this thing tax-free, and then you can pull this money out for qualified education. So if you want to help set aside money for to pay for your kids' private school or, or pay for their kid, their uh, college when they're a little bit older, you can do this. So I personally do this for my kid. I, I, I'm now on year two of being able to do this. And it's great because the number one reason, or I'd say there's two reasons why people drain their retirement accounts as they get older. The first reason is medical, which is where the HSA is going to come help you out. And the other one is paying for your kid's education because you want to help them get into a good school. Both of those reasons, people drain their retirement accounts as they're right around when they're approaching retirement. So the whole point is don't do that. Start saving money in these specifically designed accounts for those types of medical, those types of education expenses. So you can keep your retirement funds for yourself to go live the retirement that you actually want. Um, one thing to be aware of with this account is that there is a Maggie limit as well. So these are, it's fairly low, right? So if you look right here, 95,000 single and 190K married filing jointly. So if you're above those limits, you can't put money directly in a Coverdell, but there's a workaround, of course. So the way you do this is you can either find a lower income relative. So maybe grandma and grandpa aren't making much money anymore because they're retired. You can gift them the 2,000. They can put the 2,000 in for the kid. The other option is just gift the 2000 directly to the kid, open up a bank account for the kid, put the money in there, and then put that money in the Coverdell form. So if you're above those Maggie limits, which many people are, make sure that you don't put the money in directly, either gift it to a lower income relative or uh, gift it to the kid directly and have them put it in. All right. 
Now here's the fun part, step eight. I could talk about step eight for an hour and we're already approaching an hour. So I'm gonna try to hit this as fast as I can, but there's no age limit for putting money into an IRA. Like I said, the only restriction to put money into an IRA is you need to have earned income. So the reason why many people think kids can't contribute to IRAs is because they typically don't have earned income. Many kids, unless you're like a kid model or actor or something like, I don't know how many four or five-year-olds are making money, but you as a business owner, can flip that on its head. What you can do is actually hire your children in your business to provide actual services. And this isn't uh, about, you know, just paying your kids and they're not actually doing anything, right? For example, my, my kid, he's, he's a year old now and I still can't be utilizing this step because a one-year-old can't help me much in my business. But when he's five and he's able to mop the floor, I, I, don't, I don't know what five-year-olds are capable of, but the bottom line is when they're older and they're actually able to provide services for me in my business, I can pay my child I am going to then get a tax deduction on my business return, right? Because I'm paying my kid to work in my business. He now does just pay, say I paid him $3,000. If I paid him $3,000, he now has $3,000 of income. He does not pick up any of that as income because no one pays tax on the, uh, the first 13850 of income in 2023. And that's the standard deduction, right? So no one pays federal income tax when you're under that amount. So I paid him three grand. He doesn't, he didn't make any other money. He's under the standard deduction. He pays no tax. I got a tax deduction. He pays no tax. But what that also did was it opened up the door for him to put that $3,000 directly into a Roth IRA. So now he is a five-year-old who just made money in my business. I get to spend time with him. I'm teaching about business, hard work, all that fun stuff. And now I'm helping him build his own retirement account at five. How grateful would you be if your parents started putting money into a tax-free vehicle for you when you were five years old? Five years old, every year until you're 18 years old, you're putting 6,000 in, you know, whatever their earned income is. And, and of course, as they get older, they can provide more value in your business. You can pay them more. So technically, I could pay them up to 13,850 at the federal level and they would pay no tax on it. I got a $13,850 tax deduction on my tax return. My kids did not pick it up as income because they are under the income limit and you're good. The one caveat to that is, Always be aware of state income tax returns. I know most of you are in Ohio, so you're good there uh, because Ohio has a higher standard deduction, so you don't need to worry about that. But some states have like, you know, they might say the federal standard deduction is 13,000, whatever. And our state is going to give you a $2,000 standard deduction. So if you would have paid your kid 3,000, they wouldn't have to file a federal tax return, but they would have to file a state tax return. So just something to be aware of because a lot of people miss that last point is you got to be looking at both state and federal. Um, but this is a great way of utilizing both step seven and step eight to set aside money so your kids can pay for their own education. Because what you can do is pay their kid, you know, let's just say you're putting in on average $5,000 a year, starting at five years old up until they're 18. That's a lot of money that they can pull out completely tax-free, right? Remember, they can't pull out the growth. They can't pull out the earnings, but they can pull out the contribution that I put in, that five grand I'm putting in every year, whatever it is. They can pull that out, pay for their own education. How cool would that be if your kid just paid for his own college education and it was all tax-free and you didn't have to drain your retirement account, right? So these are ways to set yourself up and your family up so you don't have to you know, be scrambling to pay for your kid because he got into Harvard and now he needs to pay $150,000 a year, which is astronomical and insane. Um, all right. Let's keep moving. We're almost there. All right. We're going to hit nine and 10. Nine and 10, it's similar to what we just did where uh, you have a solo 401k for you and then solo 401k for your spouse as well. So the solo 401k is, it's essentially a 401k that is specifically designed for business owners, no employees. And that's why I said that this right here, if you're trying to get 60, 70, 80, $100,000, like if you just got a lot of money, you've been slacking on your retirement, but you have a lot of money that you want to start getting in traditional or Roth accounts, this is the way to do it. Because if you're trying to get 50 grand into one of these accounts and you're like, well, I can only put 65 into this and 65 for my spouse. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm only able to get like, you know, with HSAs and all that, I'm only able to get it like 25, 20, you know, and I'm like, all right, well, that's not enough. This is the way you do it. But the downside is you can only do this if you do not have other W-2 employees. So if you have an assistant that you pay on a W-2 because you're telling them what to do all day and you're treating them as an employee, you have to do a safe harbor 401k similar to Dunder Mifflin or any other um, you know, large employer that you're going to be just a typical 401k, similar to what we said with that matching policy. Right? That's, that's a safe harbor 401k most of the time. This is a solo 401k where you, as the sole owner employee, can treat yourself as the greatest employee in the world. You don't have to worry about discriminating anyone else. And you can put up to, in 2022, 61k. In 2023, 66k. 
And then it gets even better if you're 50 or older. So there's catch-up contributions. You put an extra 65 in um, if you're 50 and older for 22, an extra 7,500 in for 23. So the bottom line is you can put a lot of money in these accounts, traditional or Roth, if you are eligible for a solo 401k. Uh, next step is the step 10 which is this doing the same thing for your spouse. So if you're like, all right, I, I'm putting, I'm maxing out my Roth and I want to get my spouse on here as well. So we can, because you can also contribute to her. You could put her on your board of advisors, which is um, something that we recommend all of our clients do is pick the three to five people that you talk to most about business, elect them to your board of advisors. Then anytime you meet with them, tax deduction. It increases uh, the asset protection. It increases your corporate veil. It allows you to bounce ideas off someone, have meeting minutes. And it allows you to put your spouse on there and then you can say, hey, thank you spouse for being the greatest spouse ever. And I want to um, compensate you for being on my board. I'm going to put you on a W-2. So the solo 401k works for you and your spouse. Not, so it's not just, you know, I know it's called solo, but it includes you and your spouse. So you're able to basically double what we just said. So if both spouses are 50 or older for 2023, I mean, you're going from 73.5 all the way to $147,000 per year. And I'm sorry about this glitching. It's going to give me like a seizure, but uh, we're almost done. So uh, the bottom line is this is an amazing vehicle for um, real estate agents because many real estate agents only have maybe 1099 contractors they're paying, which is perfectly fine. As long as you do not have W-2 employees you are paying, you are in the game to the solo K. And I'm just going to say this right now. You guys as real estate professionals, as real estate agents working full-time in real estate, have the best tax setup out of anyone in America. You have it better than me, Okay. You guys have the best tax setup if you utilize it the right way. And I'm referring to things like this because you're a business owner, but also the tax benefits of being a real estate professional and materially participating in your rental properties. And that's a whole other conversation that we could have on how that works, short-term rental, long-term rental, material participation. But what you can do is offset, if you do this the right way, any uh, rental properties that you have where it's producing passive losses because uh, of depreciation, you as a real estate professional get to turn them active and then offset it against your ordinary income. It's amazing. It's why Donald Trump pays no money in taxes. Love it or hate it, he's just playing the game. All right, last step. Whole life, we're just gonna touch on this real briefly. Many of you know uh, Josh Halpern. He, he's one of the attorneys we work with. He also has a, a life insurance practice in New York Life. And he is the guy to talk to about this. He's, he set me up with the policy. He set Mike up with the policy. He, he, is, he can go deep dive into this like I can deep dive into tax, but I'm gonna give you high level. This is the last step because we do not recommend doing this until you've already done all these other things. So the, the whole point of this hierarchy is to go in order. Like, don't just jump to 11 because you think it looks cool or sexy or you heard about it on YouTube. It's get the easy things first, get the low-hanging fruit, then you can get to the more sexy investments uh, down the road. But this right here, whole life insurance, can be used as a tax-free wealth-building vehicle similar to a Roth account. Uh, it can get complicated very quickly. It's one of those things where if you set up the wrong policy, you're locked in. And if you let it lapse, it's gone. So it's not like a Roth IRA where if I put $6,000 in this year because I got the money and the next year I'm like, I'm strapped for cash. I don't have six grand to put in and you don't put anything in. Nothing happens to your Roth IRA. It doesn't matter. But with a whole life policy, if you're like, I don't have money to pay my premiums this year, it lapses, you're done. You just wasted a lot of money. So that's why these vehicles are great if you have good professional guidance and you know what you're doing, uh, but it is not step one. It is a piece of the puzzle, but it's not the first piece. All right. This is just a little overview of these income limits for 2023. Uh, for If you're under 50 or older 50, I can provide you guys with this. If you guys want a copy of this, I can give it to Mike. Um, but that is, that's it. Two minutes. I, was it, did I have an hour? Did I did I nail it? Is that right? Anyone? No. <laughs> All right. So I think we're good. Does anyone have any questions? All right, guys. Well, uh, yeah. I appreciate. I, okay. I asked Go one ahead. in the chat earlier. Um, do, does the HSA cover dental? Yeah, it does. So if you're if you're okay. interested in what it covers, go to IRS pub 502, Google that. And um, I, I, I literally keep it on my desktop on my computer because people ask all the time, is this qualified? Is that qualified? So IRS pub 502, it shows you the list of all the qualified medical. And if as long as it's on that list, you're good to go. Uh, it's pretty detailed and um, it does include a lot of stuff that you may think it does. I think it's got like acupuncture and certain, uh, I don't know, like massage therapy. Like there's things on there you might not think are qualified that are actually qualified. 
So if you, so I just recommend taking a look at that thing and seeing if, if what you're purchasing or what you're spending out of pocket is on there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, anyone else? All right. Well, uh, it was great getting to talk with you guys and hopefully you found some value out of that. Uh, this is, you know, we put a lot of time into trying to build out this diagram and like a step-by-step -step guide on where do I start putting this money. And like I said, this isn't about what to invest in. This is about getting the money in the right accounts and then investing in what you know best. Because I promise you, the people that make the most in their retirement accounts, right? They're, they're getting much higher than the average rate of return from the stock market of six, seven, eight percent per year, right? They're getting 20, you know, 25, 30%, you know, annual compounded interest because they are investing things like private notes or real estate um, or, uh, you know, flipping deals or whatever, whatever they know. You can do that in your retirement account. So it's about figuring out what do you know? What is your specialty? And if it's real, do real estate. If it's not, don't. So it's not about what to invest in. It's about get the money in the accounts, educate yourself on investing, figure out what you want to learn and get really good at, and just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Do the same thing over and over again, but now you're investing without creating taxable events because it's all in tax-free accounts. Um, I'll leave it with this. Also, some people give me the argument of why would I want to put money in these accounts because I can't pull it out till retirement, especially the younger crowd. And for me, I'm like, yeah, I know. That's the entire point because if you didn't put this in this account and you were able to pull it out willy-nilly, I bet you would drain it to go buy a new car. I bet you would drain it to go buy a new house. I bet you would drain it to go do dumb things and go on vacation. So the point is, it's locked up, growing tax-free for you in retirement, which I promise you, you will be happy you did when you are actually retiring. So it's just about saving, right? It all starts with saving, put the money in there, get good at investing, do what you know best um, and do it the right way and, and you'll be good to go and build wealth for, for you and your family and teach this stuff to your kids, right? They're not going to learn this, I promise you. In school, not going to learn it. So it's up to you as the parent to help them with these accounts, teach them about investing, teach them about how do I buy stock or crypto or, or uh, real estate or whatever. It's, it's you know, you got to be the one taking the responsibility to edu edu educate your kids on money and all that uh, investing and, and how to build wealth. So hopefully you found some value out of this. And if you guys have any questions, let me know and feel free to sign up using that link and we'll have a free 30-minute consult. All right, Bobby, another home run, my man. Thank you so much for, uh, for giving your time and talents there. Team, I can't recommend it enough. Not only, uh, I feel like I'm doing my, my ad for the hair club. You know, not only am I the founder, I'm also a member. Not only... Does Bobby come and help our agents out? He's actually my guy. So if uh, if you needed a, an endorsement straight from the top, Bobby is uh, is the person you want to be working with. So thank you so much for pouring into our people, that. man. All right. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. I love talking to you guys. So anytime you want to have me back or if you want to talk about something else or do a deep dive into a uh, real estate professional and all that fun stuff, happy to do it. Um, and hopefully got your extensions in, um, if not had them filed and, uh, get those taxes paid and move on. Amen, man. All right. Have a great day, everyone. We will, uh, we'll right. see you again soon, Bobby. See you guys.